What is up guys, Rick Kakis here, and today I wanted to take some time to discuss and essentially review the new Scourge of the Past raid introduced into Destiny 2 with the Black Armory expansion. Now, why do this? Well, raids are some of the most important, arguably the most important pieces of content throughout Destiny's history. The fact that this game has six player cooperative experiences that rely on puzzle solving is something that differentiates Destiny from most other first person shooters. The raids are some of the main selling points of this game and they're looked upon as the marquee piece of PVE content in any Destiny experience expansion, but with Black Armory, even more so. This is a different kind of expansion. This is the first annual pass DLC. We are not getting the amount of content we're traditionally used to. Like we don't have strikes, we don't have a new area to explore really. We mainly have this raid as the standout biggest piece of content coming in Black Armory and therefore it's really important to assess it. And that's going to give us a really good picture of if Black Armory as a whole is worth it. And so let's get started here and let's just talk about this raid's location. The fact that it's disconnected from any sort of relation to the storyline of Forsaken, like it doesn't follow the events of the Dreaming City, it isn't related to the Last Wish really, it's its own thing in its own unique area and that is very very good. The fact that you're in the last city, the first encounter has you jumping from rooftop to rooftop, that's something very unique that we really haven't seen all that often. The closest thing you could really compare it to is the final level of the Destiny 2 campaign when you're going through the last city to go to Kalos. But even there, the buildings are mostly decoration, you can't jump really on them, on top of them, and jump from one to another. In the Scourge of the Past, you actually can, which really emphasizes the experience that you're in the last city for real. By the way, in case you're wondering, at the time of recording this, I have done the raid three times now on my three different characters. I'm not just doing it once and then pumping out a review. So I do have a considerable amount of experience in this raid. And moving on from there, talking about the experience of the raid, it plays out almost identically to raid layers we've seen in the past where we have an opening encounter, then we have some semi-encounters along the way to get to the final boss room. There's a certain encounter that takes place within the final boss arena that isn't actually the final boss fight, and then you have the final boss fight. That is the exact same layout as Eater of Worlds and Spire of Stars and now Scourge of the Past. And that really brings up the question, is the Scourge of the Past a raid or a raid layer? Originally, it was referred to as a raid layer when the annual pass was first announced. On the marketing material, you can go back and see raid layer. But more recently, leading up to the release of Black Armory, Bungie started to call this a full-fledged raid and even went on record saying that because it's in its own unique location and because this is more substantial than a raid layer, they would be referring to it as a raid. This would feel more like a raid. But quite frankly, again, that layout is identical to raid layers, where you just have one encounter traveling and some mini encounters, and then you have two more encounters taking place in the same arena. It's the formula copy and pasted. Now with that being said, although the formula is the same, in fairness to Bungie, the experience is very different. And the fact that this is in its own unique location, this isn't just back on the Leviathan ship, is a huge, huge benefit. It does feel drastically different than either Leviathan, Eater of Worlds, or Spire of Stars. In addition, I would say this has one more half encounter than the other raid layers with you trying to escape the massive burning servitor, which is a ton of fun. Like that is an actual fun mini encounter. It's not a true encounter. You don't actually get like an end encounter raid reward chest or anything like that, but it's definitely more substantial than just running through some electric fields or whatever with Inspire. And speaking of that half encounter, when you're running away from the servitor on your sparrows, this raid, the Scourge of the Past, has the biggest emphasis on sparrows ever for a raid. And it's actually really refreshing. Even in encounters where you're not specifically using your sparrow, like when you're running away from the servitor, even in like the final encounters when you could just run everywhere, you don't need to use your sparrows, 
actually utilizing your sparrow is a great benefit and doing so will let you get to those areas you need to go so much faster. Using your sparrow is often the right thing to do and it's the thing that good players will do. That is super refreshing. Usually you can't even take out your sparrows this raid has an emphasis on them, and that's something that again helps it feel very unique. Now, a quick overview of the encounters. The first one, as we've stated, you're jumping from rooftop to rooftop in the last city. You are using a map to communicate with your team that's out in the city where to go, where to plant these certain spheres, where to find the berserkers that drop the spheres. That is all awesome. It feels pretty different, although it kind of has a little bit of a vibe to the Spire of Stars where one person goes up and communicates, hey, which ship we need to take out. Um, so this one, one person is looking at a map communicating where to go. It's different enough, however, and it's a really great emphasis on communication and team coordination. It's not necessarily super difficult, but it does something that a lot of raid encounters do is that it distinguishes good players and great players who can communicate, who can pick up on cues faster, who can orient themselves in a new map faster, all of that stuff. And I think that's very, very good. Moving on from there, we have the entire journey to the final arena. We have the chase sequence. I really enjoy that. It's more fun than stressful. Um, there's kind of one clear way to go. And yeah, there's some annoyance with Sparrow physics, but you're getting chased by a flaming servitor, like everyone's screaming, and it, it is a very fun part of the encounter. There is also quite a maze with many dead ends to eventually get you to that final area, which is, is kind of cool. You can go around, explore. There's some secrets to find as well. But then we move on to the second to last encounter, again, taking place in that same arena as the final boss fight. This second to last encounter is definitely neat. It's a great way of introducing you to some of the mechanics you'll be facing uh, later on, especially the different kinds of buffs you will receive for going out in the underground ring. You, you'll punch stuff, summon tanks. That's another good part. You are actually summoning and using tanks in this raid. Like, who would have predicted that? Something that seemed kind of like a throwaway cool thing that they could put in trailers for Destiny 2 during the campaign is now an honest to goodness raid mechanic and it makes it feel very different. Summoning a tank and then using that tank to clear out ads much more efficiently, all of that stuff. It's something that really makes the Scourge of the Past stand out. Really the main emphasis of this encounter, however, is staying alive, being able to clear ads efficiently, being able to not get overwhelmed by ads, that is going to be the key to success here. It's also going to be a big check on whether or not you've brought the right equipment. Clearing out those ads in the bottom ring is super easy with a Thunderlord, absolute nightmare with a Whisper of the Worm. However, you're going to need a Whisper for the next encounter, so again, being able to have access to those powerful endgame weapons is important here. But moving on, we have the final boss fight, and this is definitely the highlight of the entire raid, with a giant mech kind of cobbled together from spider tanks, it looks like, is coming at you, and there's quite a lot of things you have to do, and quite a lot of things you have to communicate with your team to succeed. Not only does some of your team have to be going and killing a berserker as quickly as possible to get spheres and summon tanks, but the rest of your team has to be shooting the white objects to take down his immune shield to prep him for the damage phase. All this while having people in the map room communicating exactly where to go and keeping on top of the ads, which there are quite a lot of snipers that will mess you up. This is really a classic raid encounter. The thing distinguishing it from others is again the presence of vehicles and tanks especially. Whereas in Crota's End, someone ran forward with the sword to take down Crota's shield and prep him for the damage phase. Now you're using a tank to shoot the boss and prep him for a damage phase. The process of prepping a boss for a damage phase is definitely not unique. It's been used over and over again, but doing it in a tank is unique and really changes up the feel of this encounter, which is very good. I also really like how scout rifles, for once, are actually like the meta in this last encounter. Having a good scout rifle to take down those snipers is super, super important. And when you actually get the raid scout, you're super excited because of that. It's nice to see a different weapon type shine. We've had stuff like auto rifles and, and hand cannons shine for so long in raids. This one is definitely more long range. And it's really awesome to see a different gun type with scout rifles finally find a time to shine. 
Now as for the actual damage phase, you have a presence of an extra damage mechanic where it sends out random buffs, you have to pair up with whoever has, you know, continuous, hey I have continuous, you have continuous, if you pair up then you'll do way more damage. That's all fine and dandy and it emphasizes communication quite a bit, being able to organize your team and pair up really efficiently and fast is going to let you do so much more damage. But the fact that it is RNG is a little bit annoying because, you know, if you just randomly have convenient placement or you don't really have to switch very much, you're going to get so much more damage in and certain teams are going to beat this phase so much easier than other teams just because I got lucky with those buffs. And that isn't the best feeling where your team's success can rely on pure RNG. I don't exactly like that. I like the idea of having to snap communicate I'm not entirely sure I like the idea of random RNG being a big factor in your success. So that's the raid, the things I liked and didn't, but now it's really important to talk about the raid rewards, often the thing that's forgotten in the discussion of the best raids and so on, but the raid rewards are the reason you're doing the darn raid, so are those any good? Well, in this case, there's some very powerful weapons you can get. For example, I got the curated and essentially god roll of the rocket launcher, and my goodness, this could just be the best legendary rocket launcher I have in the entire game right now. Uh, impact casing to do more damage for direct shots, super important for PvE, then tracking and cluster bombs, a monster in PvP, very, very good weapon. However, in the raid previous to this, I got two of the same exact rocket launcher with trash rolls. Moving target on a rocket launcher was a big emphasis of one of those. Like, just stuff you would not want. And I'm still on the fence of whether or not I think that raid weapons should be capable of getting random rolls. Back in Destiny 1, everything was random rolls except for the raid weapons and that emphasized their uniqueness and it allowed Bungie to do some really cool things especially with the Wrath of the Machine weapons where they had unique perks that no other weapon had. The auto rifle, the Genesis chain could have focused Firefly. No other auto rifle could get Firefly in the entire game. It made it so unique and it made it very very powerful. We miss that entirely with random rolls in Destiny 2. Yes, it emphasizes replayability and going back into the raid and trying to get those god rolls, whereas before, once you got all the weapons, you're kind of done, but it's undeniably disappointing when you struggle through a raid encounter just to get a trash roll on a weapon. And frankly, armor too. But my biggest problem with the rewards is not necessarily random rolls. I could more than deal with random rolls if there was intrinsic unique perks. Looking back at Destiny 1's raid rewards, both weapons and armor always came with unique intrinsic perks that you couldn't get anywhere else. For example, on the Wrath and Machine weapons, you had Whirlwind's Force or whatever that would do extra damage against Fallen um, and actually helped with mobility. And with Taken King, you had an intrinsic perk where it would do bonus damage against Taken. The Vault of Glass weapons did bonus damage against Oracles, super important in that raid. But armor joined the fun as well. Uh, the Wrath of the Machine Gauntlets, for example, actually made heavy drop more often against fallen enemies. Like, that would be so cool to have back in Destiny 2. That was one of the best parts of raid weapons and armor in Destiny 1 was those unique intrinsic perks that not only differentiated them, but it made them truly good and they felt like fitting rewards for doing the hardest content in the game. If you get a trash roll in this raid, it doesn't feel like that because you can't even throw in a unique perk. You're just getting a normal rocket launcher like you can find anywhere else in the game with a bad roll. So if I could fix one thing with the rewards, it would be adding back those intrinsic unique raid perks to weapons and armor. And I think that we should expect to see that in the next raid coming in Penumbra. Bungie, you gotta get those back in the game. These raid weapons don't even feel like raid weapons when you aren't getting the absolute curated god rules. So again, I don't wanna have RNG dictate my enjoyment of this piece of content, which is otherwise fabulous. Seriously, the rewards are really my only main concern, and aside from the lack of an intrinsic perk, the rewards are otherwise fine. They look unique, they often have very good stats, and if you do get a good roll, it will seem very powerful, it will seem like a justifiable reward. 
I'm just speaking from the perspective of someone who's played through all of Destiny's raids, and I definitely see a decline in the value of these raid rewards. But again, the rewards are the main problem. The actual piece of content is very good. It feels refreshing. It feels different. I love the emphasis on the vehicles. The actual encounters do feel unique enough to distinguish this raid from others. The one main concern is that it is very similar in layout to a raid layer, and I think calling this a raid may be somewhat pushing it. However, slightly pushing it is as far as I would go in that accusation because the presence of a bunch of raid armor and weapons, like other raid layers only had two weapons, this raid has quite a bit more, so the presence of all those rewards does more make this uh, feel like a true raid. So is this a good piece of content? Overall, yes. There are some problems with it. It's not perfect. It's definitely not the best raid. In fact, I don't think it's in the running, but it's not a bad raid. It's not an unfun raid. It is a very good piece of content. And that's something with the annual pass. A lot of people are wondering, is it worth it? Where is the content? But Black Armory is priced considerably less at only around 10 bucks. And I think Scourge is honestly better than some of the raid content we've seen in expansions costing $20. So that's a huge positive for this raid. And so guys, that's it for the video. I hope you enjoyed and found this uh, interesting. If you did, please remember to help me out by simply rating and especially sharing this video. If you guys want to see more Destiny 2 content similar to this, don't be afraid to slap that subscribe button. If you guys want to get in touch with me and keep up to date with the latest channel activity, the best way is to follow me on Twitter at Rick Kakis. That's linked in the description down below, as is my Twitch channel, which you can also follow. Again, I hope you enjoyed the video, and as always, have a good day.